Good morning, New Calvary Baptist Church, Facebook family and friends. This is your favorite executive pastor. Pastor, be reaching out to you from the sanctuary of the New Calvary Baptist Church as we prepare to worship God and spirit and the truth. The word of God says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord and let us exalt his name together. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers and sisters to dwell together in unity. Let us pray our prayer of invocation, all wise and eternal creator, Abba, Father, Daddy, Mother God, we come before you this morning, oh God, just to say thank you and to say that you're welcome in this space. You're welcome in our hearts. You're welcome in our minds. Have your way in this worship experience, oh God, that we will leave this experience not like we came, but excited to run on to see what the end is going to be. It is in the marvelous, the magnificent, the miracle working, magnanimous name of Jesus Christ, our healer, our redeemer, our helper, and our friend that we pray. All of God's children said, amen, amen, and amen. Let us worship God in spirit and in truth.
and truly we are grateful to be in the house of the Lord on today. We celebrate and rejoice because the Lord can do anything but fail. We are reminded in this moment just how awesome and how wonderful the Lord is. And so we celebrate and come together to give God praise in this moment. We are blessed by your presence. We're blessed that you are here sharing with us, worshiping in spirit and in truth. For the Lord is good. God's mercy is everlasting and God's truth endureth to all generations. This is the day, beloved, that the Lord has made and we have come to rejoice and be glad in it. We are so grateful to worship with you virtually in our New Calvary Baptist Church worship experience. We're grateful for your time, grateful for you being here and hope and pray that you understand and know that as a church family, we are continuing to worship and to share and to pray for you and for one another. We indeed in this moment are so grateful for our praise and worship team. Amen. Please put your likes up. Put your hearts up. Let them know you appreciate them. Let them know that they are ushering in the spirit for us as we continue to share in this moment. We are pushing, beloved, in this month of August. We are continuing uh, to make moves and to continue to be faithful in our worship experience. We hope and pray that you are enjoying your Wednesdays, your remixes of our summer madness um, episodes and listening to some of the best preachers in the country who have come to share with New Calvary Baptist Church and have been a blessing to us. So we want to just remind you to continue to tune in Wednesdays at 7 p.m. as you would hear and just share in the worship and participate uh, and just be refreshed and revived even in this summer that you might be connected to hear good preaching, to hear a word from the Lord, to get a good lesson, to be reminded that God is still working things out for you. We can Continue to pray for all of those who are uh, in uh, this particular season. We are praying for covering. We are praying for protection. We are asking that God would continue uh, to watch over all of us, even in this COVID-19 season. We are asking you in this season as those who are preparing uh, in this month of August, as you're preparing parents to go back to school, as you are preparing uh, the whether or not you're going to go back to school and all of those things are still in the air. Just continue to be prayerful and be safe. We want you to be careful, most of all, that you would understand uh, that we want you to use discretion, just as we are here in the church, that you would be mindful of, of what God is doing. Also, I want to make sure that you are subscribing to our new Calvary Norfolk VA page, um, not just on Facebook, but on YouTube as well. We are uh, continuing to get people to subscribe so we can continue to put content uh, on all of the avenues and the ventures and the venues that we have here at the church as we continue just to do ministry virtually. And as we take those ideas from our Bible study and put those together as we understand what it is to disciple differently. We are asking that you would just be continue to be prayerful. We want to continue to thank you for your giving, continue to thank you for your faithful giving uh, to New Calvary as you have sent and mailed uh, your gifts in as you have brought them to the church and as you have continued to go on Givelify and be faithful. We want you to know how thankful we are for you and your faithfulness even in this season. We continue to do ministry. We continue to have to take care uh, of the administrative side of the church. We continue to have to keep lights on and bills paid. And so we thank you for being faithful for that and continue in your tithe and your offering. We're going to continue uh, to move forward in this worship experience as we prepare again to hear from uh, this awesome musical aggregation. We're going to go to the Lord in a word of prayer right now. And so we're asking whatever it is that uh, the Lord has laid on your heart to pray or whatever it is that you need in this season that you might put it in the comment section of um your Facebook, that you might just list it, that uh, our ministers may, virtual ministers may be available to pray with you and for you uh, in your concerns. And so as we look to the Lord in this moment, we ask that you would bow with us and that you would share wherever you are, wherever you are in your house, if you're in your car, uh, wherever you are, in what room you are, that your hearts and minds might be prepared uh, for prayer in this moment. For God, we thank you and we love you so much. We're grateful for this time that you've allowed us to come together. 
grateful, oh God, for your power and grateful, God, for your strength that has just continued to keep us throughout these days. God, we're asking right now in the name of Jesus that you would just watch over us one by one and name by name, that you would touch us situation by situation, circumstance by circumstance. God, as we continue in this season of praise and worship, God, we're just asking for your hand to be upon us. We pray, God, uh, for this season. We pray, God, that you would continue to keep us covered. We pray, God, that you would uh, allow us to just continue to be safe uh, in this season. That as uh, cases seem to be increasing, that as administration seems to have no answers, that is, that there are different uh, ideas and different thoughts about how to approach this sickness and this disease, God, that you might bring us covering. That we would ask, God, that you would cover us with your anointing, cover us with your grace, cover us with your love, dear God, that we would just continue to trust in you. We pray, God, for our families right now. God, we pray for our places of business. We pray, God, for our finances. We pray, Lord, that you would just continue to lead us and direct us in the way that you would have us to go. Let us, God, continue to have the vision and the insight to be the church that you've called us to be. Help us, dear God, to continue to uh, do the work of ministry. Help us, God, to see the ways we can connect outside of these walls, that we would continue to be faithful and fruitful in all things. Show us, God, what you need from us. Let us continue to grow and let us just continue to be stretched, that as we reflect on our relationship, we might understand what it is called to be the best that we can be. And we promise, God, in all things to give you praise, honor, and glory. We promise, God, to lift up holy hands and to trust you through it all. We promise, God, that our worship will not cease, that our thanksgiving will not be silenced, that our appreciation will be heard, that our joy will be expressed, that, God, we will walk in the light of the Lord, that you're still making crooked places straight, that you're still making rough places smooth, that you're still working things out and the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all of your people shall see it together. So God, as we continue to go forward, we give you praise and we give you thanks for being God all by yourself. So have your way and continue to minister and we thank you for it all. For it is in the wonderful, marvelous and wonderful name of Jesus that the people of God who love God together say amen. Say amen and say amen. Come on, get your hearts ready. Get your likes ready uh, to receive the New Calvary Baptist Church praise and worship team. Uh, let us receive them as they come and as they set the atmosphere for our worship and our word.
God, we thank you for this moment, how grateful we are for your rich anointing and your power falling down upon us. Speak to our hearts in this moment and minister to us, God, as only you can. And we promise in all things we'll give your name the praise. For someone needs to hear a word from you today, God. We're asking that you would just speak to our hearts, minister to us as only you can. Bless this, your instrument, God. And may your work, may your word, may your power, may your anointing touch, rest, rule, and abide with every heart that is to hear. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of thy grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope and let my will be lost in thine. It is in the wonderful, marvelous, and matchless name of Jesus, people of God who love God together say, amen. Amen. How grateful we are uh, for this musical aggregation blessing us in this moment. Amen. 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 Call your attention to the book of 2 Samuel. Book of 2 Samuel. 24th chapter, verses 18 through 25. 2 Samuel, chapter 24, verses 18 through 25. Here now the lesson as it is translated in the New International Version says, on that day, Gad went to David and said to him, go up and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite. So David went up, and as the Lord has commanded through Gad, and when Aruna looked up and saw the king and his men coming toward him, he went out and bowed down before the king with his face to the ground. Aruna said, why has my Lord King come to his servant? To buy your threshing floor, David answered, so I can build an altar to the Lord that the plague on the people may be stopped. Aruna said to David, let my Lord the King take whatever pleases him and offer it up. Here are oxen for the burnt offering and here are threshing sledges and ox yokes for the wood. O King, Arana gives all this to the king. Arana also said to him, May the Lord your God accept you. But the king replied to Arana, Now I insist on paying you for it. I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. So David brought the threshing floor and the oxen and paid 50 shekels of silver for them. David built an altar to the Lord there and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. Then the Lord answered prayer in behalf of the land, and the plague on Israel was stopped. We'll talk from this thought, this idea today, from this, I, this, this title, Making It Work. Making It Work. I have a friend, a preacher friend, who often talks about growing up with he and his brother and his sister. Three children raised by a single mother. And he often talks about his mother making sacrifices for them. All of them now college graduates, living their lives and successful in their own right. But they never forgot what their mother has done to make sure that they were taken care of and provided for. He mentioned to me that one of the most interesting times of the day was dinner time. He said his mother would come home from work, her job not really a living wage, but just enough to keep bills paid and some food on the table. And she would seriously ponder what to do for dinner. 
Three children who were simply coming into the kitchen to ask an exhausted mother what was for dinner. And a mom who never told them she didn't know. She never told them that the cupboard was really bare. She never told them that she would have to wait until the end of the week to put food in the house. A mother never really wanted her children to feel like she had no help for them and that there was literally next to nothing. But a mother who always wanted her children to see that she was taking care of them. My friend said that his mother would sit at the kitchen chair. She would sit back and put him on her lap and would say, when he'd say, Mama, what's for dinner? He would say, I don't know, but we're going to work this thing out. What that meant was that she was going to do what she had to do with what she had. You know, without question now in this season, many of us are learning what it means to work things out. Our situations may not be as drastic or as desperate, but they are no less significant. What my friend's mother knew and what many of us are now learning is what it means to sacrifice. There's nothing else that we've learned in this season. We are learning what it truly means to sacrifice oneself. Now, don't get me wrong. Sacrifice means different things to many different people. But all of us in this season of pandemic have had to make some serious sacrifices. Sacrifice, by definition, means to give something up an adjustment to, a, un, to the usual routine, an adjustment to what you usually expect. This year, without question, we have seen some places where all of us have been called to sacrifice. For some, it's been in our travel and in our access to different places and things. For others, it's been our income and our financial responsibilities and what we have been able to do. For some, it's being limited to see our family and friends as frequently as we would like. Many of those sacrifices can seem superficial to some. But all of us, especially people of faith, have sacrificed somehow or another in our worship. We have sacrificed in the coming together and how we share in the goodness and the grace of God. Many would say we have even suffered in the expressing and gathering of believers. You'd be surprised how much it means to some people just to gather together, to share and be connected with one another. The trauma of different worship, the mourning of some rituals and practices that have been taken away for the sake of distancing. Many things have been sacrificed without question. But prayerfully, what we will learn in these moments is that we can make the adjustments. What we have learned, hopefully, is that we are tougher than we look. We can learn that in these moments of celebration, there are new ways in which we are learning to express who God is in our lives. We are learning that there are new possibilities in how to do ministry and how we share the love of the Lord with other people. Just like what happens in so many other times of sacrifice, we learn to create new things from the challenges we face. Just like so many things in this season, just like so many things, even in our worship, we have to figure out how to make this thing work. Now, when we journey in this text, my brothers and sisters see that to make things work, you have to prioritize your relationship with the Lord. See, David needs to find his way back to a right relationship with God. And I don't want you to miss that. That's not insignificant. Because if you look at the beginning of chapter 24, the Lord is upset with Israel and David. And David tries to handle things his own way. The text says that David does a census of these fighting men under his command. David wants to know how many soldiers he has at his disposal. David has reported the rationale for the instructions. He wants to know how many soldiers he has in his command. And so after a nine-month campaign to find out how many soldiers David has under his leadership, the report came back that 800,000 are from Israel and 500,000 are from Judah, about 1.3 million soldiers in all. But soon after David realized that he had done this foolish thing and the Lord was not pleased, in fact, God, he asked God to take away the guilt of sin he was feeling. Why would David ask for the census when he felt like he had sinned against God after the census were taken? I mean, 1.3 million soldiers under your command would bring most military leaders comfort. So why does it make David so troubled? 
David soon realizes that no matter how many soldiers he has, the issue is not the number he's working with, but the issue is the power that he's working with. See, here it is. David may have over a million soldiers at his disposal, but that's not the reason he's been victorious. David has been victorious because God has been with him in battle. I'm trying to help somebody in here. It doesn't matter how many or how much David is working with. In fact, that God has with, been with David, God has, David has been receiving victory, and David messed around and forgot it. David forgot where his strength really was coming from. David forgot the power he was working with. Here it is. David forgot who was really getting the victory. And see, sometimes we find ourselves out of line with God and out of step with God's plan and purpose because we fooled ourselves into thinking that we've got victory because what we have under our control. We think that we've got things under control. We think we've got people under control. We think we've made our decisions under our own control and that we can start to believe that it's all happening because of us when we don't recognize who's really in control. Can I help some of y'all that whatever we have or whatever we don't have, how much you're working with or how little you're working with, we're still stewards of what God has given meaning that we're caretakers of what we have. Can I make this thing live? David is the caretaker of the army of the soldiers, but the army and the power really belong to God. What we possess really belongs to God. What we operate with really belongs to God. And what we really belongs to God, we can't confuse our success with God's power. Uh, we can be successful, but we are successful not just because of our own gift, but we're successful because we know how to connect to the right power. David's relationship, he understands, is out of order in this moment. His focus is out of whack. He's lost sight of where his help really comes from. And before we start talking about how David is messing up, before we start pointing the fingers at how David is missing the point, we need to know that all of us can get out of order from time to time. That all of us can lose sight of what this relationship is all about. All of us can get our focus out of whack and misrepresent the Lord every now and then. And so God sends David a message. He says, I can deal with this three ways, David. One, you can deal with a famine for three years. You can have your enemies chasing you and attacking you for three months. Or I can put a plague in the land for three days. How do you want to do this? Don't miss this. God says there's going to be a consequence for your action. There's a response to your behavior. Oh, if I wish somebody was hearing me today, that there is a response to the actions that you make. People out here at the beach creating, helping create a pandemic. People out here not wearing masks in public places. When the medical experts tell you that it's keeping you safe, people comparing freedom to mask wearing and the numbers of infected rising and spreading all over the country. The president can't wear a mask because he thinks it makes him look weak. There's a consequence because of your actions. You see, some of the things we don't consider is we can't control the consequences of our behavior. But we can control the decisions we act out before our behavior. See, David said, said the plague to the Lord. I don't want the enemy after me. David says, send the plague, a three-day plague. It won't be too bad. But the text says 70,000 people died from Dan to Bathsheba. And David was in great distress. Oh, if I had time, I'd talk about the consequences of poor leadership. Oh, if I had time, I'd talk about uh, poor leaders that don't care about what happened to people because they're interested in their own success. If I had a time to write another sermon, I'd talk about the consequences of poor leadership who can't look past their own investment of what they're going to leave. And as a result, the people suffer as a result of their decisions. But the word came from Gad, a prophet. And he told David, the word from the Lord is this, go up and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of our ruin of the Jebusite. Some of y'all missed it. Gad tells David, because your relationship with the Lord is not what it needs to be. Go and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Arun of the Jebusite. Here it is. Gad says to David, you need to create your space for worship. David, because you need to realign yourself with God, because you are living with the consequences of your action, you need to find a space to create a place for yourself to worship. Y'all don't know when to shout. 
because the things are, are the way they aren't the way they need to be. When things aren't happening the way they need to happen and things aren't where they should be, I need to create some space to have a talk with the Lord. I need to get into the presence of the Lord and figure out what I need to do and how I need to get back in step with God. And I wonder if there are times in your life when you say things don't feel like they should. Things aren't happening the way I want them to happen. Most of the time I'm feeling like I'm outside of God's presence and I need to find some space and some time with the Lord. That there's some moments when I just need to carve out some space and have a little talk with my God. I'm not talking to y'all who always think y'all got good on the Lord. See, you're good on the Lord's side. I always know what God is up to and who know God's every thought and God's every removed, but I'm talking to the folk who know how to say I messed up and I blew it. I, I'm talking to the folk who say I don't get it right, and because I messed up, I'm going through it right now, and I need some time with the Lord. I need to, some help to get some stuff back in order. God, help me create some space to where I can get back in line with you. Making work means that you got to create some space in order for God to speak, but here's the second thing. Making it work means we have to prepare ourselves for our time with God. See, David, here's the words of the prophet. The people are suffering at my hand. I got lost in my success. I didn't consider God's presence in my victory. So I need to get this thing back in focus. I'm headed to Aruna's land to build an altar. I've messed up so much. I've distanced myself from God too much. I need to find an altar to build. I need to find some space to create some worship. David makes it into Arana's land, and when he is spotted by Aruna, he went out to meet him. He bowed down before the King David and put his face to the ground. We just read it. Aruna asked him, he said, why has the Lord and King come to his servant? David told him to buy your threshing floor. I need to buy your threshing floor so I can build an altar to the Lord that the plague on the people may be stopped. Now, a threshing floor, those of you who don't know, a threshing floor is a large space with stone or concrete floor on the bottom, and it's used as a place to separate grain. See, what you would do on a threshing floor is the stalk of grain is placed, and it comes into the sheave that's holding the grain. And what you would do is they would take a fork-like tool, like a rake, and they throw it into the air, and the wind would blow the sheaf away. It would blow the sheaf away, and the grain would fall to the ground, and you would pick up the, uh, you pick up the grain because it, the sheaf had been blown away. But needless to say, you would need a good space for this process. Needless to say, you need space to throw it up in the air so the threshing floor would serve as a perfect place to build an altar. Obviously, one of the best places is on Aruna's property. And so David says, I want to buy your threshing floor so it can become a place for the altar. So two things. Aronia is a Jebusite, meaning he's not Jewish. So when David conquered the land, he did not force the people out. So Aronia is a faithful subject from a different background. But he's facing two things. First, he's loyal to the king, and there's a famine, and so he's going to trust the king to do what's necessary. The second thing is, David says, I need to buy this space so that I can build an altar to the Lord. How does a threshing floor become a place for the Lord? Well, somebody would say, put an altar on it. But the truth of the matter is, when you put an altar on it, it's still a threshing floor. It's just a threshing floor with an altar on it. What happens is, it becomes a place for praise based upon the presence it promotes. Some of y'all are missing it. Worship happens in a place based upon the presence that you're seeking. It doesn't matter what the place is or what it used to be. If you promote the right presence, it can become a place of praise. If you promote the right presence, no matter where you are, it can become the right place for your praise to happen. Can I help some of y'all? You see, you think I'm talking about the thing in context of God and how the Lord shows up. That's just one side of how the Lord shows up. I'm talking about in terms of a worshiper, how do you create the presence of God for God to make his presence known? Here it is. God is omnipresent, meaning God is everywhere. So it's not God 
God's presence that needs to be prepared. It's the presence of the worshiper that needs to get ready. It's the heart of the worshiper that needs to get ready. It's the mind of the worshiper that needs to get ready. Can I make this thing live? Some folks can't worship until there are 40 people in the choir stand. Some folks can't worship until they see red carpet on the floor. Some people can't worship until they hear the Hammond B3 or the lectern or the funeral fan in the pew seat. All of that is fine, but that's about pretense because all you got to have all that stuff, but you still can't worship. You can have all of the frills of church, but no worship because there's no presence of God in the moment. But you get some people who have a sense of, I just want to be in the presence of the Lord. I just want to be in the presence of God. I don't care where you are or who's with you. Worship will break out every time. I don't care who you are. If you got some folk who are ready to be in the presence of God, God's presence will break out and worship will happen every time. Some of y'all right now, even in this season, are realizing that when your living room turns into a praise space. Some of y'all are being surprised that when you're watching TV on live stream, all of a sudden at the kitchen table, a praise moment starts to happen. Some of you understanding you in your garage and you walking around in your neighborhood and all of a sudden you need to lift your hands and just thank God because you know it's about the presence of the Lord and not the proximity of your connection to the building. See, it's not about where you are. It's about where your altar is. When you have an altar, a place of worship the Lord, the right presence means the right intention and the acknowledgement of who God is. It doesn't matter where it is. Worship can take place. Oh, some of y'all know y'all got an altar at your desk and can't nobody see it. Some of you know you got an altar on your bathroom mirror. Some of y'all got an altar on the hood of your car. Your altar can be in the produce section of the supermarket. But when you bring in the presence of the Lord in your situation, everything becomes a worship moment and your praise can break out. David says, I need this threshing floor because I got to create atmosphere because it needs to transform into a place of worship. Aronia says, take what you need, take whatever pleases you, and offer it up. In fact, Aronia says, take these oxen for the burnt offering. And here's some sledges from the threshing floor and some yokes that go on the ox. Use the wood for the fire. Take what you need. May the Lord God accept you. Some of y'all missed it. Aruna says, take what you need, use whatever I have, and may the Lord God accept you. Aruna is a Jebusite. This is not his faith, but he is offering his stuff to be used. Aruna is making it work. He's making the oxen work, making the yokes for the wood-burning sacrifice so it can all take place. It doesn't have to be his faith. He says, as long as David believes it, I believe that God can show up, and if God shows up, it'll turn into a blessing for me. Aruna wants David, God's David, God to bless him because he knows if the Lord blesses the king, a blessing for me ain't too far away. And some of y'all don't know when to shout, but you ought to encourage some people to worship. You ought to encourage some people to say thank you. You ought to encourage some other people to get in the Lord's presence. Don't get in their way. In fact, you ought to help them. You ought to encourage them because if the Lord shows up and blessing them, your blessing can't be too far away. Your faith might not be where somebody else's faith is, but you ought to know how to help God or help somebody else praise the Lord. You ought to know how to encourage somebody else get close to the Lord because if the Lord shows up for them, then God could send the blessing your way. Got to make this thing work because you got to prioritize what it is. Then you have to make sure that you create the right presence. But finally, making it work means you got to make your worship personal. Your worship has to be personal. Here it is. Aronia says, I want to help you. I want you to help get the help you need to get into the presence of the Lord. Because if you get into the presence of the Lord and the Lord hears you, something's going to shift for everybody. If you get in the presence of the Lord, something's going to shift for all of us. So he might not be my God, but I want you to get to him as quick as you can. Huh? And it's going to help me with what I'm going through. This plague just ain't affecting you. It's on all of us. So what happens to you can happen to me. So 
I'm not about to stop your worship just because it ain't like mine. Uh, I ain't about to stop your worship just because it don't look like mine. I'm not about to get in the way or criticize or critique your worship just because it doesn't look like mine. And look, Aronia gives these things to David freely. He says in verse 23, O king, uh, he take these things, gives, he gives all these things to the king. Have them uh, freely. Watch this. Aronia knows that if a blessing is coming his way, he has to be willing to give what he has because God blesses the giver. See, this just ain't about giving. This is about how we give. Aronia needs this work to work for David. And when you want God's will to work for you, you're willing to give of yourself and understand the sacrifice. See, when you give from your place of appreciation, you are looking for God's doors to open, right, and God to be good to the people who worship. You see, this part of your blessing that is connected to how you bless others, there's a part of your blessing that is connected to how you treat others and how you give to others and how you share with others. And if I want God to bless me, then I'm not going to cut off what I can do for others. Aronia understands that he is a blessing, that the king in the hopes that the blessing is going to come his way. But then David makes his own statement of faithfulness. I love this part. David makes his own statement. He says, no, I ain't going to let you give it to me. He insists on paying for it. He says, I will not sacrifice to the Lord my burnt offering that cost me nothing. You missed it. David says, in order for me to connect with God, I got to go all in. Something has to come from me in order from God to connect with me. Some of y'all still missing it. David says, I can't take it from you and then give it to God as my own. I'm not sacrificing anything if I do that. I need to lay something at the altar in order for it to be received. David as king is well within his rights to take what Aruna has offered him. But if he uses it, the offering don't come from him. It's an offering that has to be personal. He has to cost him something so that God knows that he's committed. Can I help some of y'all? If I take what Arunia gives me and make it my offering, I haven't lost anything. And if I haven't lost anything, then I'm not really trusting God for anything. Because when I make a sacrifice, it's costing something when it costs me, and I'm trusting God with it all. And when I make the sacrifice by definition, it means I have to give up something. But I'm giving up something in the faith that whatever it is I'm giving up, God is going to make up for it and provide for me. So when I sacrifice, I'm letting God know that I trust God for what I I need to happen in my situation. David says, you can't give me the oxen. You can't give me the threshing floor. You can't give me the wood and then turn around and say, I'm making a sacrifice. You can't give it to me. I can't give God a sacrifice like that. I haven't put any skin in the game. I haven't stepped out of faith. I haven't trusted God to handle what's going on. I'm in the situation. If it's going to change, I got to step out and I got to give something of myself. I got to put some risk out there on my own. And I declare that if some things are going to change in your life, if some things are going to change in your situation, you're going to have to step out and take some risk. You're going to have to trust God with some things that well, you aren't used to trusting God with. You're going to have to work with some new ideas that you haven't thought of before. You're going to have to trust God with it all. David pays 50 shekels of silver for the threshing floor and the oxen. And the text says that David built an altar right there to the Lord and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offering. And the sacrifice was made. And the Lord answered the prayers of David on behalf of the land. And the plague in Israel was stopped. And I just stopped by to tell somebody that when you lay it on the line, when you're willing to make it work, when you're willing to sacrifice for yourself, when you're willing to make a tip to get it back in step with the presence of God, God is a able to restore. God is able to stop the struggle. God is able to answer the prayer, but you got to be willing to make the sacrifice and go all in. You got to be willing to sacrifice and put something in the game and trust God with it all. You got to be willing to step out there and put yourself in a situation where you can say, God, I've laid it out here and all I can do is trust you with it because I believe that deliverance is on the way. So, you got to put some skin in the game. Like my buddy said, 
his mother would sit there with him on his lap in the kitchen and say, baby, I don't know how we're going to work this thing out. I don't know what it is, but we're going to work it out. So my friend said his mother would go into the cupboard. She would look in there and get a little flour. And then she would go in the refrigerator and grab this little tiny piece of beef that wasn't enough to feed nobody. Then she grabbed some peas and some carrots that she had made from a few days before. And then she would get a pot and put that piece of meat in there and she'd take a little of that rendering and make a gravy. Then she put some water in there and then she put a, cut up a few chicken legs that she had put together and then before you know it, she had a few pieces of this and a few pieces of leftover and then it would smell up the house and after a while it looked something like a stew would be bubbling in that pot and my boy said that his brother and his sister would have their mouths watering until their mother said, come on here and eat and have a sit down and with a bill of what mama made and they'd never know that she made it coming from practically nothing. He said their mother would just watch them and smile and tell them, eat up, baby. She said, she said, go ahead and eat up. And they would eat up and they would just know that mom was making a way for them. Didn't know that mom was struggling to pull it all together and teach whatever she had. And years later, he said, when I got older, he said, I asked my mother, I said, Ma, I ain't know we was poor until I got old. He said, I didn't know we was struggling, but I tell you, you never ate with us in the days. You never ate with us. And his mother said, well, I always wanted you and your brother and sister to have a enough. And she said, but Ma, there was some times in when you, we knew that you went hungry. And she said, well, the truth is, I wasn't never really that hungry. He said, well, what you mean, Mama? He said, when we would sit down and eat, you would watch us eat. She said, yeah, you hardly ate with us. And she said, yeah, but I wasn't hungry. She said, the whole time I was cooking, I'd be tasting. The whole time I was cooking, I'd be getting a little myself. And I ate a little bit along the way. And I came by to let somebody know that when you sacrifice, you got to make it work. But it doesn't mean that you ain't able to taste what's coming. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, taste and see that he'll make a way out of nowhere. Oh, taste and see that if you put it out there and make the sacrifice, God will take care of you. And I know in this pandemic, I know in this season, you've been making a whole lot of sacrifices. But I just want you to taste along the way. Just get a taste along the way. And you'll see that God is still making ways for you. You'll see that God is still providing for you. You'll see that God is still supporting you and sustaining you. Oh, can you think of the moments where you could taste a little bit of the Lord's blessing? You can taste a little bit of the Lord's provision. You can taste a little bit of the Lord's grace. You can taste a little bit of the Lord's power. Is there anybody who can taste what the Lord is up to? Can you taste what the Lord is doing? I know you're sacrificing, but taste and see the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. The Lord's making it out. I know some of us are going through. I know all of us are sacrificing. I know it's frustrating you to no end. But I want to encourage you. Keep making it work. Keep making it work. God is still doing some things. God is still working some stuff out. And you can still see that there's power and possibility in the Lord's name. So as we continue to share with you, as we continue uh, to move forward in this month and in these days ahead, please be mindful. We will continue uh, to share tomorrow. Please be uh, at 8 a.m. We're going to have our prayer line, our prayer call. So just be mindful. Tune in as we continue to pray with and for each other. And as we continue throughout this month, continue to watch and share in our Summer Madness clips, our Best of Summer Madness a series as we share in the month of August. We look forward to continuing to share with you, and we will see you next week. And we're going to continue to lift up the name of Jesus. So unto him, God, we are grateful. Unto him, God, we bless your holy name. Unto him, God, in all things we come before you humbly and appreciative of this time that you have allowed us to share. So minister to us, God, even in our sacrifice. 
Encourage us, God, even in our sacrifice. That in those places where we don't know what else to do, touch us, God, and in all things we'll give your name the praise, the honor, and the glory. And so may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord place his countenance, his presence upon you and give you peace both now and forevermore. The people of God who love God together, say amen. Say amen and amen. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Take care. Be good. Safe. Peace.